There we go. All right. Okay, we're ready to go. Okay. Chair Clark. Present. Vice Chair McCann. Commissioner Baker. Mr. Baker? Present. Yeah. Mr. Flanagan? Present. Commissioner Friedman? Present. Commissioner Futterman? Present. Commissioner Garrett? Present. Commissioner Gothier? Present. Commissioner Miller? Mr. Miller? She's muted. She's present. Um, yep. We have a quorum. Okay. Hey, thank you. I'd like to welcome the commissioners and staff members and visitors that we have tonight. There will be time for public comments later on in the meeting. Uh, I'd ask everybody to please keep your microphones muted during the meeting and please raise your hand to be called to speak at the appropriate time and then unmute your microphones and please do not use the chat feature in Zoom. First major item on the agenda is the acceptance of the agenda. It was emailed and posted on Thursday, October 15th for city policy. Is there a motion to accept the agenda? Motion to accept the agenda. Thank you, second. Rob. And second? Second. Carl, thank you. Is there any discussion on the agenda? Okay, so all in favor of accepting the agenda, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Mm -hmm. The agenda is accepted. Thank you. Now we'll move on to staff comments. Um, Patrick has covered them in some detail in a, in a memo that was in the agenda packet, but now he'll speak further, I assume. Yeah, so I just have a couple of uh, updates to my update. Uh, so first of all, with regard to council meeting topics, um, the planning uh, department did create a survey to get more input on their um, the general plan priorities. So um, I imagine that they'll be getting some additional input from businesses on that front. Um, so we'll see uh, if they get any comments on the existing priority language. Um, yeah, the, uh, the, the council did have a few general comments about it and they were actually all more sustainably oriented, um, like not promoting traffic, uh, not promoting parking downtown, um, and things like that and, and walkability and things like that. So, um, so very much in support of some of the changes that we made, um, uh, to that document as well as uh, additional changes that they'd like to see that are more sustainability oriented. Um, the second thing is um, for the meeting coming up this week, um, the EVA streamlining permitting uh, agenda item was not included. So I assume that will go on to the November agenda. Um, and then the other thing is I wanted to mention that I will be doing a, a short presentation on a, um, a street lighting project by Southern California Edison. They are converting uh, the rest of our um, uh, street lights over to LEDs. And so there's about 500 uh, remaining street lights that they're gonna work on uh, probably in November to December timeframe. So I'll give a presentation on that uh, tomorrow or on uh, Thursday evening. And Jim, you have a question. Yeah, did, could you repeat, what did you say that, so the, the city council members were accepting of, of parking, paid, paid parking, I missed what you no. said. So, okay. They, um, one of the items that's included in the priorities in the general plan is some language, uh, I think it says something about promoting parking downtown and they said, we absolutely don't want to do that. Like that's oh, good. Not, okay. not where we're going. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yep. So, um, so that's it on the uh, council topics. Um, I did want to just report that we had a very successful shredding and e-waste event. Um, a big thank you to Commissioner Miller who came and uh, stayed through about 10.30, uh, helped us out a lot in terms of direct and traffic. Uh, and Dan and I were there um, for the full duration and we were joined by Gary for a little while in the morning and uh, he looked great. 
So uh, we appreciate his help in um, helping us get set up for that and to um, make sure that that all flowed smoothly. So, um, so I don't have numbers yet uh, on that event, but uh, hopefully we will get them. We might be able to get them this week in advance of the council meeting. But uh, but it was very successful, um, and people were there until the bitter end. So, um, I, yeah, Patrick, I have one question. Sure. I got a message from uh, my friend, um, Brad Fur, who runs a media outlet. And he said he received the news release from Amy Blaisdell on October 14th. And it was said he complaining to me that that wasn't enough time for him to do anything. So I, I, it sounds like it was successful, but I don't know if he just got mixed up and didn't get the original communications. But if we're sending out uh, news releases on the 14th for an event on the 17th, I'm a, I'm, he was a little concerned. Well, so we advertised that primarily through Nextdoor and Facebook, um, okay. and then Amy was out actually for a good part of the week, so I sent it to her. I, I think I had gotten it to her earlier, but she was not in the office until that Wednesday. Okay, um, I'll pass so, that along. Thank yeah, you. so that, 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 that pre formal press release got a little bit of a late notice, but, um, but I only heard from actually a couple people who said that they didn't hear about it, so... So I thought that was a pretty good, pretty good turnout. Okay. So. Uh, I also, yeah, go ahead. David. Yeah, um, since you had mentioned um, the EV, um, uh, the EV ordinance, uh, the AB twelve thirty six this morning, I attended. I was going to cover that in another EV charger, but actually, it's more related to the city council. So this morning, there was a very helpful Cal EV IP workshop on streamlined permitting, which is exactly uh, the 1236 ordinance. I should receive the slides tomorrow and I'll forward uh, them over to you. There's a lot of um, information, in particular about accessibility um, for handicapped. Mm -hmm. um, so what I'd like to do, particularly since there's a little bit more time, because we've got three weeks in between Thursday's council meeting and the next one, is I'll take a look at the draft ordinance based on what was on the agenda from March um, and pulled and let you know if there's, a, I'll, I'll send you over the slides, but use that just to um, double check what the ordinance says, the draft, um, if there's anything else that I think that we should, uh, we should include, um, I will send that over to you, uh, hopefully by the end of the week, early next week. All right, great. And that's all I have in terms of additional updates and staff comments. Thank you, Patrick. The next item is public comments. This is time for members of the public to address the Sustainability Commission on agenda items and items, items of general interest within the subject matter jurisdiction, jurisdiction of the commission. The commission values your comments but pursuant to the Brown Act cannot take action on items not listed on the posted agenda. Three minutes are assigned for each speaker. I think we, we do have one visitor. Is there any public comment? I guess not. And we don't have any presentations this evening. So we'll move on to um, acceptance of the um, meeting minutes from the September 15th meeting. The minutes were emailed and posted on Thursday, October 15th. Is there a motion to accept the minutes from that meeting? Yeah. Uh, Chair Clark, I'd like to move acceptance of the minutes of our September 15th meeting. And I did send two very minor corrections in. One was a slight tweak um, to the reference to the SCE um, reach code, which was actually after the meeting, and I'll talk about that later. And second, on DCE, uh, I was the one who made uh, the comment and not Commissioner Baker. So um, with those two uh, small corrections, I'd like to move acceptance of the minutes. And I've already sent those corrections into Daniel and uh, Patrick. And I made those corrections. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Who's the second? I second. Okay, thank you. Um, all in favor of accepting the minutes, please say aye. 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 Any discussion? Further discussion? I have to abstain. I wasn't there. One abstention and any no's? Okay, minutes have been accepted. Thank you. Now we'll move on to old business. And a number of these items are covered as well in the memo that Patrick included. 
Sure. So um, just uh, some updates on a few fronts. Uh, again, disposal of foodware and plastic waste reduction ordinance um, that is a little bit on hold right now. So um, I will try to coordinate with council members to figure mm -hmm. out how they want to move that forward. Um, it's, it's just increasingly difficult as we go back and forth with these different tiers and businesses go um, up and down, it just it just makes a challenging situation even more challenging. So um, so we'll see how that progresses. Um, the in terms of the climate action roadmap, uh, David and I have been working on uh, just keeping that document up to date and uh, based on the things that are happening. And um, so we continue to update that. We had hoped to get it onto the agenda. Um, for the 8th and that did not happen. Um, and so now we, we are gonna wait until uh, November, most likely uh, when uh, commission, uh, council member Holstage is uh, back from maternity leave. So uh, it's my understanding she'll be back in November. Uh, we should be post election then. So, uh, so that'll also be important for us to know in terms of um, who's going to be on the council next. So um, anyway, so that'll come back to the council agenda um, and I'll work with uh, leadership here to figure out the timing of that. At this point, it may make sense to just uh, defer it until December um, and when we hopefully have the uh, results of the greenhouse gas inventory uh, and we can probably t have a more robust discussion about where we are and where we're going in terms of the numbers. So, uh, so we'll play that by ear in terms of uh, getting that back on the council agenda. And I'll, I'll, again, I'll work with leadership to, to figure out the timing of that. Um, any questions about that? Okay. Um, the greenhouse gas inventory, again, I included some notes on the teleconference that we had with the contractor to clarify some questions uh, that were raised at the last meeting, and um, I think those were pretty straightforward. Um, the uh, inventory continues. The thing that we're waiting for at the moment is the information from uh, Southern California Edison on our 2018 and 2019 numbers. So I have requested those. Um, it's kind of a process for them to get them to us. So we're expecting those probably late this month, early next month. So hopefully we'll have those by early November so that they can continue on their analysis for the current uh, numbers as well as the projection to, uh, projections for two, two 2020. So continue to let you know about that. Uh, and that's all I have for old business. And moving on to new business. Okay. <clears throat> Um, so I had very much hoped to have for you a uh, scope of work to approve from our preferred vendor for the EV charger expansion. Um, however, they were out here last week for a site visit and uh, that we came up with lots of other ideas about phasing and number of chargers and things like that. So they're uh, kind of going back to develop a best and final proposal for us. Um, and I was hoping that we were gonna get that so that we could have it in time for the November uh, council meeting, but it does not look like that's gonna happen. So. Um, hopefully in our November meeting, uh, I'll have something to talk about with you guys in more uh, detail uh, about that. And then uh, we can move it forward to council, hopefully in December. So that's where we are. Jim Flanagan, you have your hand raised. I do. Um, so I'm curious about the new EV superchargers that are going in at the Bank of America building. Uh -huh. And their business model is to put 350 kW chargers, which I've never heard of before, but they're brand um, new. Brand new, and yeah. uh, they seem to be dead in the water. Is that something that we can facilitate or that you're aware of, or what's going on with those? So it's interesting you asked that question because I have been kind of mm -hmm. monitoring that because they approached us a while back when they were uh, installing them and kind of wanted to make a, uh, uh, make a big deal of it. And these are the fastest chargers on the planet. And right, we should. <laughs> the very first time, actually, this is the first time they've ever used them. So, um, so it would be this kind of a big deal. And so I don't know if things aren't going as planned um, on the operation or if they're just waiting. So I was gonna actually circle back with them to uh, find out the status. So I, I'll report back to the, the, count, uh, the commission on that. 
because I was curious as well, because I, I assume yeah. that <clears throat> by now. This, this would seem like a great opportunity for, for Palm Springs to throw him a bone and get on the bandwagon and be a part of this. I would hope we could, we could do that. Yeah, it was it was actually kind of an interesting situation. They were they were all gung ho for it, and then they kind of uh, um, said <clears throat> they didn't want publicity, and so they were they would let us know. Um, so I'm not sure not sure exactly where that is. So I'll I'll reach out to the folks that contacted me and, and see if I can get some clarity on that. Great, thank you very much. Sure. Um, all right. Um, and, uh, and David, just FYI, one of the things that we are talking a lot about in the, um, the approach for the EV charger expansion is ADA compliance. And so there's uh, a fairly fair amount of um, uh, requirements that we have to go through with regard to, uh, uh, based on the number of chargers that we install. Yeah. So um, that's what we're kind of struggling with in a few locations is um, uh, kind of how to meet that requirement um, in the space that we have, so. And that was, you'll see some very good slides. It was a representative of the um, state, uh, division of the state architect um, who spoke for uh, close to 20 minutes. And there's some very detailed slides that outline the requirements. So that's good for you um, just to sort of have a checklist of what those requirements are. And apparently there'll be even more requirements going into effect next July 1. Uh, oh, that really? We'll in, 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 in January. Um, so, so then that over to you, but that's one of the things. And, and of course they did confirm that city install chargers are, are subject to those requirements. So yes. um, that's, uh, that was a large part of the, the, the talk this morning. Okay. I'll get those slides over to you. I should have them tomorrow. Great. All right. And so I'm just checking, um, uh, Commissioner Miller, did you make it back in? I've seen a couple of attempts. Attempts. No, I can you back. hear me now? Can yep. you hear? Yep. Okay. Okay. Well, you're for me. You're cutting in and out. Or it's pretty bad. Um, I oh. I had a problem with a Zoom meeting a couple of days ago, and uh, I thought I had corrected it. I'd gone and you know rebooted everything and actually went to Spectrum. And very disappointing. Um, are, are you on a cell phone now? Oh. Lonnie, are you on a cell phone now? You're muted. Because you're, you're breaking up quite a bit. Yeah, and you too for me, so. Huh. It sucks. Okay. Um, so we have this unstable internet connection. Yeah. Uh, like. um, hmm. Trying to think if there's a workaround for that. Don't stop, you know. Okay. I just made it. Okay. All right. Uh, we shall move on. Um, and uh, the next, let's see. Um, so, um, so as I mentioned, I, the EV charger expansion is still a work in progress. Um, it is significantly more complicated than I had ever imagined. So um, anyway, so we're working through it with the engineering folks. And uh, again, I hope to have something concrete for you guys next month. Um, so the next thing I wanted to talk about and get your feedback on is um, the sustainability scholarship program idea. Um, I uh, have been kind of toying with this idea for a while. Um, originally, we were trying to get a grant from the state on uh, reusable foodware. And so I was hoping to do something through that and get money to, to businesses to help them with that. Um, but that did not work out. And so um, I, what I'd like to do is just allocate some money from sustainability and from uh, the recycling budgets to um, help some businesses out that are trying to uh, basically do the right thing. So, um, so what I had envisioned was a, a plan uh, or a program like, like I mentioned here is would it be available for any licensed business 
who was uh, uh, doing something uh, sustainability related, including helping them pay for, for example, their recycling and their um, uh, 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 organics waste management bills, uh, which we want them all to be in compliance with. I thought that that might help uh, spur some interest in that. Um, and, you know, businesses like uh, gardeners could maybe access it to get some battery uh, money for, for additional batteries for leaf blowers and things like that. Uh, the other thing that people aren't as aware of is, is the requirement from the state to have um, recycling containers in their stores for people that uh, are inside their restaurants in particular for people that eat on site and manage their own waste. So mostly fast food restaurants. But uh, anyway, they could use that for, for containers, uh, recycling containers, and things like that. So I just wanted to get your input on this, uh, see if you had any thoughts or suggestions on the scope of the program, level of funding, um, applicability, that kind of thing. So Greg, you've got your hand up. Yes, um, I had a couple of comments on it. Uh, okay. the first, first was that the, it, the material said the maximum scholarship would be $500 and for the available funds you identified there, that's 200 projects. That seemed like a pretty optimistic target for me. I would kind of rather see a thousand dollars and a hundred good projects. And um, that was my comment on funding. Uh, I thought the examples were really good and helpful in terms of the, the form there of the kinds of projects that we'd be interested in. The first one, that, that, that management aspect isn't really a lasting effect. And I think, so I would encourage that only be eligible for part of the scholarship. But the, which, which was that, sorry? The, yeah. the, it's on your next page. Okay. Um, oh, I see. Recycling and organic management fees. So uh -huh. those fee, you know, if we give all the money to management fees, then when the grant or scholarship ends, we have no guarantee that that will continue. So mm. um, I'd rather see just a portion be able to go to management fees and the others have to go to some kind of more permanent solution. Okay. Um, and uh, then from the way the materials were structured, it seemed like they submit their expenses and, and we hear about the project after the fact mm -hmm. and they're not really submitting a, a proposed project idea for kind of review and approval. And um, I thought there should be an, a, a brief, not an onerous proposal from the, the person seeking the scholarship and then an approval from uh, the commission and then the reimbursement form which you provided in the material. Yeah, that's a good point. I had actually thought about that um, and thought that it was probably a good idea for us to get something to approve uh, just so that we were, uh, so somebody didn't spend money that they, we weren't going to reimburse them for. Right. And maybe we would do like a, a brief webinar or Zoom meeting to kind of explain the scholarship program to mm -hmm. businesses and uh, at, at an appropriate venue where they would actually show up <laughs> for a right. meeting. Right. Uh, and uh, if there were a, a subcommittee form to kind of review those proposals and do that, I would be happy to volunteer to be on that. Okay. Yeah. Um Patrick, guys, David, I can work with you on the list of sort of or potential items for energy efficient or water efficient equipment. Uh, I think if somebody wants to install an EV charger, um, that should qualify. Uh, it's sort of broadly energy efficient or add some solar panels. Um, water efficiency could be things like, um, uh, you know, uh, landscaping where there's a rebate from EWA, but additional money could always help or um, potentially um, uh, those uh, um, flowless toilets, uh, which also I think EDLB had and perhaps still does offer rebates for. So we can work on that. And obviously for water efficient, we should run that by, uh, uh, by Ashley in particular to make sure that we're kind of all on the same page for any water. Um, so I'm happy to work with you on that, um, on, on those specific things and come up with at least some you know, broad buckets of what might be included for those for that bullet point. 
And I agree with Commissioner Gauthier that there should be sort of a pre-approval you submit a proposal um, with an estimate before you go out and buy something. Right. I think it's a great idea, um, especially since we weren't able to get the grant that you have been working on previously. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, the, the um, mix is good. Uh, what, there's 120 that would be available for recycling and 80 available for um, sustainability. Um, I think the, our, one thing I was thinking about is our perennial problem of actually getting the word out and having it received. And um, going down a little bit deeper, I think one good use of this funding um, might be for our gardeners. Um, we're more than a year into the um, ban on gas powered blowers. They bought their, their battery powered blowers, but probably a lot of them need to buy replacement batteries. And those are pretty expensive. So I think it would be important to, to be able to get the word out to, to that group of businesses. I know it, it's, it's hard, but I, um, you worked hard at it um, right after you started when we were starting the program. So I think that's something that really- Yeah, I think that we will, um, we would definitely do uh, some radio ads for that. Um, and uh, try to get the word out that way. That was seemed to be pretty effective. Um, so, and the state rebates still apply too. So, so if they wanted to turn in a gas one, they can still get the money, uh, discounted units uh, for that, and then they could get the whole cost covered uh, with something like this. So, yes, Sandra. Oh, I would be more than happy to join in and and help on that. And I do like the idea of. Uh, reducing the number but increasing it from 500 to a thousand. Mm -hmm. so, like, for example, if you were needing to uh, purchase and go into the reusable foodware or any of them, but in that one in particular, $500 going from zero and in, in, in is only going to get you small, but a thousand dollars for a small business could really get all of your packaging and everything right. away and you could be able to get enough so you can get it at a good price. So I, I think that is a very good idea. Okay. And like I said, I'd be more than happy to help in any way. Okay. All right, any other uh, comments? All right, um, so what I'll do is um, I'll revise this and uh, send it back our, around to everybody. Um, and I'll probably maybe send it to Greg and to Sandra first, just to give you guys a quick look and then we'll send it around to the group for final, a final look. Um, and then I would like to get it onto the agenda for November, uh, the November council meeting. So um, I'll turn that around this week and then we'll uh, I'll put the staff report together next week. Also a uh, question, any idea yeah. on what the uh, life is on the batteries for the electric blowers? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know how long they've been lasting. Um, I know that typically the, the, I don't know, the less robust ones um, that I've used uh, have only lasted a couple of years. Um, so I think we're probably getting to um, close to the end of the, the useful life for some of those. I did see a few of them show up in um, at the uh, uh, drop-off uh, this weekend. So, um, so we might be seeing some, some more of those. Um, I can ask, I can also ask the, um, the lawn care guy the, uh, um, at, at Yoshi's. Um, he should know that too, so, but yeah. At the beginning, I think a lot of people were buying extra batteries. Yeah. So you need to replace them by now. Right, right. Yeah, I think it is good timing. All right, um, any other questions, comments? All right, super. Well, we'll put that together so that that's ready, uh, again, uh, ready to go to council next week. I, I, I'll, I'll run it by uh, folks internally just to make sure there's nothing that I'm missing in terms of, um, uh, I don't know, I's and T's and, and crossing all the necessary things, doing, uh, crossing the necessary bridges to get this done, so. All right. Thank so you. let me go back up to the agenda. Um, 
So All right, so that was the end of new business. Right, and now we'll move on to standing subcommittees and commissioner reports. So the, the first item is the standing subcommittee for solar and green building. Okay, I can uh, start off on that. So um, lots of webinars in addition to this morning's 90 minute webinar on, um, on EV charger. Uh, permitting, I've been continuing with my webinar attendance, um, see what other local jurisdictions are doing in the energy field. Um, so as I mentioned earlier on September 29th, I, I was a speaker at the SEC, uh, SCE me, webinar on reach codes um, and reported on our progress and the slides from that webinar are in the packet. We had about 30 people um, from various jurisdictions uh, attending, including a representative from Palm Desert from our area was on the line. So thank you, that was good, uh, uh, a good attendance. Um, Reach Code team had a webinar last Wednesday on cost effectiveness of residential retrofits, including some of the measures that were discussed in the draft climate um, action roadmap. So um, as Patrick mentioned, I'm sort of keeping that up to date. So I'll update the cost effectiveness chart and the draft so, uh, staff report once the new version of the Reach Code study uh, is, uh, is released next month, if that's, uh, well, in time for the uh, November council meeting, but it's on that agenda. If not, uh, um, I'll obviously continue to keep that up to date. Um, and also on the reach code side, I've been asked by the reach codes team to serve as a beta tester for their new cost effectiveness app that's on their website. So Patrick, if you could let me know if that's okay, um, so I can get advanced access to the app data um, and, and features uh, that'll sort of help keep uh, the information up to date. So I'm just kidding now. Check in with that and let me know if I can sign up for that. Uh, next is the Home Energy Audit Program, and that was approved by the Commission last year, uh, last October. And so, um, also in your high agenda packet, got the uh, uh, application form, and Patrick and I have worked on that. And I think, Patrick, that hopefully should be ready to launch in the next uh, few weeks. Yeah, yeah. So um, one comment I had on that, uh, David, was um, do you think it's worth including in there some reference to the SCE program that if they still offer it uh, to do some sort of a free energy audit or free energy assessment? Do you know if they still do that? Um, what I am aware about, and that's a, a sort of getting to the DCE side, but it's something called the um, ESA Energy Savings Assistance Program, um, and it's for Care Fira customers. And oh, when, okay. um, so I'm aware of that. I don't think there's anything available for regular customers, and, and it's tricky for between DC and SCE, but I know that ESA um, is still uh, available, but the CPUC uh, suspended it in, um, uh, in May because of COVID or maybe even earlier April <coughs> because of COVID and I don't think it's come back online yet. Um, so let's hold off on that and I've got a on the DC side a call in with uh, with Benjamin on Thursday to talk about um, various things. So um, we'll cover that perhaps in the uh, DC side Patrick um, and then if I get any more information you can also add it to the website or you know tweak the form if necessary. Sounds good. Thank you. Uh, okay, so that's it for there. And, and um, so once that's uh, uh, <coughs> launched, then we'll do some publicity with a, a press release from maybe Blaze Dillon at the East School. We can publicize it in our Office of Neighborhoods report. <coughs> and finally, Patrick and I have are continuing the discussions with National Renewable Energy uh, Lab about their streamlined solar app. And we have another call tomorrow afternoon. And we'll be joined by the building division staff person who handles solar permits. And if she's uh, interested, then hopefully Palm Springs can sign up as a beta tester uh, for that program. And it um, is part of just sort of automizing, make le less work for, the, uh, for folks in the building division and the solar installer gets an immediate permit and their fees are about 20 to $50. So it's a, it's a win-win for everybody and no cost to the city for being a beta tester on the app. So that's it for my report, but lots of things that we're working on right now. Thank you. Next is standing subcommittee on waste reduction. So um, I, the big thing that we were working on uh, this past month was the um, annual um, report to the state uh, that documents our um, waste sent to landfills and our recycling activities. Um, <clears throat> that 
report is uh, quite lengthy and um, involves uh, data from lots of different sources. I did want to just mention at a high level um, the recycling and waste to landfill numbers. Um, and let me just kind of minimize you guys. Um, so hopefully you can see the chart here. Um, it has two things on it. So the big orange bars are the total waste that we send to landfills each year. And this, uh, uh, I tried to do it back to 2009. Um, and so just to show you a, a, a trend in um, increasing amounts of, of uh, waste going to landfill. Um, the other line that you see, the gray line in the middle, uh, is our per capita disposal rate. Um, so that has gone from about seven uh, or so, um, 6.7 I think was the lowest point. Um, and now we're, we hover around 9.1 is, is kind of where we're at right now uh, in terms of um, the per capita uh, disposal rate. And so that's um, 9.1 pounds per person per day. Um, and then the target that we have, which is set by the state, is that yellow line at the top, which is about 13.7 or 13.9. So um, we are still well below the um, target that the state has set for us. So that's the good news. Um, and then the bad news is that, that the um, kind of waste disposal rates uh, are creeping up. So um, again, we need to make sure that we're, we're um, continuing to promote recycling and waste reduction efforts and um, making sure that we do that, especially uh, as we go forward here. Um, I'm sure that 2020 is going to be a strange year, so we'll see how those numbers work out for us, um, given all the people that were staying home uh, and the increase in trash that we've seen uh, on the residential side. So we'll just have to see <clears throat> how it's um, different for, uh, or how that affects our, our numbers going forward. Um, yeah, Sandra. Uh, uh, kind of a slow growth there, but then in 2017, or by 2017, it um, spike up and then level off again. Do you know what caused that? So I do not know. Um, there's uh, The program has been pretty steady all the way along, and so I don't know if that's um, a big increase in businesses, because if you look at uh, sort of our uh, the growth in the city, uh, you know, 2009 was, of course, the recession, and then 2010 to 2013, 14 was kind of our build build back, um, and then um, I don't know if we had a big spike in uh, business openings in 2016, 2017, or not, but uh, that that could be associated with uh, an increase in in business and maybe a little bit in population. I did look at the population numbers. And they are up a little bit from um, where they were in 2009, but not a lot. So maybe maybe a couple thousand uh, people. So it's not a huge increase in population, but it is it is a little bit. So, so not not clear what the what the big change is. Uh, uh, Patrick, yeah. 2017 was probably the the year that most of downtown, the Rowan, a number of the uh, shops uh. downtown opened. So I I can't say that, but that is a change that downtown. Um, kind of got going uh, around 2017. So that may be an effect. That may be at least partly the cause of the bump. Yeah, that's a great, good, great point. Uh, Jim, did you have your hand up? Yeah, I, 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 for me, it jumped into my head that that's Amazon and Amazon sales went from 30 billion to 60 billion during that period. Really? And that's, that's 10,000. I mean, my neighbor's trash cans are filled with boxes and styrofoam and I think that's the bulk of their trash at Amazon so I'm, that's my guess. Interesting. Huh. I didn't realize they had such a spike. Uh, it's pretty steep right but if you look at Q1 of 27 I'm looking at it right now on my computer it's 35 and at the end of Q8, Q4 of 2018 it's 72. Mm -hmm. hmm. Wow okay. So I don't know, uh, that could so, I don't know what, we can, what we can do about it but <laughs> yeah yeah. Um, well, hopefully it means a spike in our recycling numbers, which is not necessarily the case. So, um, so the other chart that I have here is our curbside uh, residential recycling and green waste uh, curbside collection. 
And I just, th there's a lot of other numbers that are reported in that report, um, but these are some of the easier ones to, to, um, uh, to come by. And these are reported by Palm Springs Disposal Services. So it's helpful because um, they kind of know the history here. So um, anyway, um, you'll see that from 2016 to 2019, we're pretty steady in the mid 4,000 ton range for recycling. Um, I did ask uh, Palm Springs Disposal about the um, high numbers that we were reporting back in 2012 to 2015, and they did not know what that was. So I think what happened was um, that number being reported included a bunch of other stuff that's not necessarily mentioned in the report. So we're doing a little bit of digging to find out um, what, where those numbers may have come from. Um, but I can tell you that I did look at the Palm Springs disposal numbers, which are the numbers that I used for 2016 to 2019, and they were consistent with this 2016 to 2019 um, numbers number. So um, they they we are pretty steady, um, assuming that the Palm Springs disposal numbers are correct. Uh, we're pretty steady um, on our annual tons um, of uh, uh, curbside uh, recycling collection. Uh, and so again, I'll, I'll kind of do a little more digging on this, the high numbers that we are reported here in the past. Um, on the green waste front, I think this is uh, another one that has increased a little bit over the years because of the increase in uh, the number of folks that are uh, accessing uh, green waste collection services uh, at the residential level. So um, this is a number that we'll probably see increase a lot over the next year or two, uh, given 1383 and the requirement for us to collect organics from uh, residential um, folks. So, uh, so we'll see that number go up quite a bit. So, um, so that's all I have on that front. Um, and again, there was nothing super surprising about the numbers that we submitted this year. Um, we are trying to do better in terms of collecting that data more regularly and um, to get uh, to get a sense of uh, how we're progressing. So, so anyway, so that's that's kind of what uh, uh, some of the numbers were that were reported, and uh, just to give you a sense of that. Um, and then I think that was really about it on the waste front. The other stuff is included in the, the summary report. Um, and happy to answer any questions you might have about that. So, all right. Okay. Um, let me go back. The next so, is. Yep. Yeah, go ahead. Standing subcommittee on World Environment Day. This is Jennifer. So I haven't spoken with Greg and Sandra yet to see, you know, any ideas about possibly you know, turning this into a more virtual event because we really don't know what it's going to look like um, next June, but it would be nice to do something. So, you know, I'd love to, to speak with you both and Patrick, if you have any input, of course. Um, what I do have to report from the Environmental Education Collaborative, which I'm still on the board for, um, we, you know, we've been now sponsoring the sole sponsor for the environmental art contest. It, it went really well virtual this last year. So I proposed at the last board meeting to, um, to add an essay contest because that's something I've been wanting to do just to give, you know, if it's not a virtual, uh, a visual artist, an opportunity to perhaps express with the literary arts so we're looking at that, um, both essay and poetry, and then perhaps also adding um, some kind of, you know, somebody said they, they called it a soapbox, but something that could be more performance art oriented. So if we had some different options of how specifically students, but of course adults, if they want to participate, they're welcome, um, so that we could increase the opportunities while everyone, you know, may still be um, quarantining. So those are kind of interesting ideas. You know, I don't know because we probably will be looking for other sponsorships if the commission would like to maybe be a sponsor again. So we sponsored, you know, we're a co-sponsor for the contest for a few years. Um, so that's something I just wanted to, to propose. 
and see if there's any feelings on that. But it, it just seems that this next year is so uncertain that whatever we can do to support students while they're at home, you know, um, to increase the opportunity for critical thinking. And um, we're also thinking about a theme, you know, in the past, it's, you know, for the last 15 years, I've been rotating the five elements. Um, for the younger kids, it seems like that's probably the easiest to keep that. It's going to be water again, um, which it just seems so crazy that these seem to rotate so quickly through <laughs> five year cycles. Um, but we're thinking about adding an environmental justice element for the older kids. And I think that could be really interesting um, at this time in you know, many, many ways, but also for the essay contest and giving kids a chance to really express how they're feeling um, about what's going on in the world. So that's my report. Thank you, Jen. The You're next um, subcommittee is Ad Hoc sub Subcommittee on Walkability and Pedestrian Planning. Um, so we did have, uh, I did have a call with the contractor last week and I, uh, we had a call with the ad hoc committee yesterday, um, to provide the contractor with a little bit of feedback on, uh, some of the recent materials. So, um, just to update you on the status of where they are, um, they did issue uh, some invitations to uh, some individuals to participate in a community advisory committee. We tried to identify groups that were already engaged in pedestrian safety efforts, as well as um, the local business community, the tribe, and some other organizations. So um, hopefully uh, we, we got a little bit of feedback, uh, at least from a couple people so far that were interested. So. We hope to have the first community advisory committee meeting in November, uh, probably uh, November 18th after our next meeting. Um, the, they've also created a, an, uh, a public input survey. So they've got um, uh, a tool that they can use uh, once the word goes out to the public that this is happening to collect feedback on people's concerns about uh, pedestrian safety. Um, and also a mapping tool so that people can just click on areas and identify hotspots. Um, the first community advisory committee meeting will be focused uh, on two things. One is just reviewing kind of the, the priorities for the project and the scope and, and just their role, uh, but also um, they, what we hope to have uh, for them to look at uh, right off the bat is a list of projects that um, and concerns that people have already identified um, and how those kind of stack up uh, based on the priorities for the, the project. So, uh, so anyway, so uh, we don't want to start from ground zero on this. We want to start from what we've heard already and get additional input from, from the folks that are on the committee. Um, the other thing that I think the committee would be helpful, will be helpful for is um, identifying pedestrian opportunities. Uh, so we wanna make sure that in addition to addressing some of the uh, problem areas that we have, we wanna also make sure that we are identifying and building on potential pedestrian opportunities like the new downtown park, um, the renovation of the town and country and the new cultural center um, for the tribe. So, so anyway, so that's really the, uh, where we are with that. Um, the consultant is really leading that effort and we're trying to provide input along the way. And, um, but that's, that's where we are at the moment. Any questions? Okay, All right, so that's it for me then. Okay, so we'll move on to ad hoc subcommittee on bicycle routes and cycling. Oh, that's me. Yes. Um, so I, uh, I have a question. I, I had a meeting with, am I on? Oh, um, I met with Lisa Middleton uh, yesterday, just part of her campaign thing. She's doing some Zoom calls. And um, she, I told her that we had some interest in some on a bike path on South Palm Canyon. I met with her just as myself, not as a sustainability commission, but um, we added yeah. that. She was, she was very interested in continuing. But so I was curious, um, Patrick, we originally had an infrastructure bike infrastructure meeting scheduled for March, like around March 10th, and the whole thing kind of got kind of got uh, kiboshed because of COVID. Is there a possibility that we get that meeting back on track? 
Yeah, in fact, we should do that because um, the other thing that's in the works is there's a new grant under development on sustainable transportation that's going to be coming out here uh, very soon. And so we want to be primed to submit something for that. So, uh, so yeah, I was thinking about that. When you mentioned you were meeting with her, I was thinking, oh, gosh, we had that meeting set up with her and just, just yeah. happened. And I think now that her campaign is kind of over with, she has a little bit more time. So maybe we could, do you want to take the, get that going again or should I, or what can we do? Uh, sure. I can uh, reach out to her and see if she'd like to uh, start thinking about rescheduling. that. Okay. Thank you. That's it. Thank you. Next is ad hoc subcommittee on Night Sky. Uh, let's see. We, um, uh, we, well, I sent out a, a memo today to, uh, can, sorry, can, am I being heard? Yep. Yes. Okay, good. Uh, so I sent out a memo today to uh, Patrick and Roy for um, review that, uh, that we can send to the appropriate um, government agency here in, in Palm Springs. Um, and basically, I told you last time that, uh, that I'd get, gone and done uh, an estimation of the light output of the uh, lamps that are uplighting the palm trees uh, up on Takis Canyon. And the value I was getting was exceeding the, uh, the amount that, uh, that the guidelines for the city um, designate by five or six times, so quite a bit. And, uh, and then I went out and did some calibration of, of my little measuring device, which is basically an app on my smartphone to uh, three other um, uplighting lamps in my in, in the close vicinity to Takis Canyon, and uh, and those three other uplighting lamps were in the range of about four thousand lumens, which is the um, the limit according to the guidelines. So I, I think we have enough calibration that we can send this to um, uh, City Hall and ask them to replace those lamps and and reduce them. Um, this is all kind of small potatoes. It's it's also providing a basis for us to just start to, to develop an ordinance. Uh, just just on the basis of my um, looking at these lights and these lamps and, and they're uplighting in these different places. Obviously, the, the ones that the city has installed up on Takis Canyon are, are way too bright. But I think that, uh, that a 4,000 lumens limit um, is also too bright and, and we could get away with something, you know, three quarters of that or even less. And, and you would still get a nice view of your palm trees uh, if, if you absolutely have to. And... Uh, uh, and then maybe we'll we'll continue with that and, and also uh, consider a, a curfew on them so that we could turn them out completely at something like 11 p.m. Um, is there any questions? Yeah, uh, Vice Chair McCann, I actually have a question um, from when I did my landscape lighting is that in addition to the lumens, the landscape uh, lighting designer said the Kelvins were important. So everything I think was at 20, at least the inside was at 2,700 Kelvins. I don't know whether that also applies, whether there we would set a standard so that they're not like super, you know, bright and kind of as natural colored as, as they can, assuming they're LED uh, kind of things, but just, just a thought based on what I did. Okay. Rob, so you're gonna go ahead and um, send that memo? Um, I think, well, since, since the way I wrote it, uh, Patrick, you were co-signing it from the Office of Sustainability. So the question is, you know, yeah, how should we proceed from here with it? Right, I think you should send it to me from the commission. Oh, um, okay, so I should rewrite it with, with me as the author and just send that to you. Yes, so... Okay. It would be, um, so the question that I'm always asked, as I always say, is what did the commission say about this? And so it would be helpful if I could say that the commission would like for the city to do this, uh -huh. not just Rob. <laughs> so, then, oh, yeah. so it should come from the commission. Then. Yeah, I think, I think it should be a recommendation from the commission is, is, is my, my feeling about it. Cause um, I think it gets, it just gets more weight. Um, that's really the, the only thing. Oh, then in that case, do we need to send this memo out to all the commission members and, and get a vote on it? Um, uh, what do you think? Yeah, I think so. Might have okay. discussion. What do you think? 
basically what you have in the memo is that you've made some measurements and that the lighting exceeds what's in the uh, city ordinance and you're recommending that the city um, basically meet the code, mm -hmm. specifically replace some of the light bulbs. Um, uh, right. Uh, with, with the caveat that it's not an ordinance. It, it's just a set of guidelines. Set of guidelines. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I, think, I think with that information, we could probably right now go by consensus um, to, to go ahead with this. Mm -hmm. uh, sure, I'm happy to, to just send it back to, to Patrick with, with, a, with a commission recommendation. Are there any comments from other commit commissioners from what we've already discussed? It's not that complicated. And it might be efficient if we could just do it yeah. by consensus now. Can we just uh, take a vote and have a motion and say it was unanimously approved by the commission? Sure. I think, I think that would work. Yes. So is, is there a motion that we, ex that we provide this information, that we agree with the recommendation that Rob has described to uh, uh, replace the lights or and meet what's in the guidelines? Yeah, make a motion to uh, submit a letter on behalf of the entire Sustainability Commission to City Hall that they meet the existing guidelines for lighting down topics. Is there a second? I'll second it. Okay. Any any more discussion? And just just a clarification, Rob. Is it just down Talkwitz? That is the only place that I know that the city has installed lighting that is out of compliance with these uh, regulations. Okay. Um, that doesn't mean that there aren't others. Right. And one of the, uh, like the, um, there's, a, there's a residential property here on my street is one of the places where I took a measurement of another light and they were also out of compliance, not by much, but they, they were, it's measuring at 4,300 lumens. So mm -hmm. again, this is, this is groundwork to start to really develop an actual ordinance that would have more teeth in it. And, uh, and then of course, um, hopefully we could go after everybody who's out of compliance with it, not just the city lights. And, and I remember now that that was one of your original goals is to come up with an ordinance for this. What yeah. was, right. It, it might be good timing just in the sense if SCE is looking at these other street lights, we might be able to have them look at those ones too. I don't know what's involved in that. That'd be nice, but we also do the meter readings or, or do the readings of the lights. You, you got to stand over top of them with your cell phone. <laughs> are you talking about street lights now or are you talking about up lights? I'm no, sorry. just up lights. Yeah. Well, oh, oh, okay. Oh, they're up lights. Street, okay. Street lights. Oh. I don't think we're, street lights is a very complicated thing that Edison's not going to, I mean, there's a lot of laws around that, but right. um, should we also include a recommendation that the city look, apply this to its other fixtures or its other lights or is that too expanded? I mean, it's not really our job to go door to door and check all these things out. It would seem that, well, uh, I guess and that's- The recommendation could be to, to, to address those and to investigate others. Yeah. Well, okay, so should, I, should it be to investigate other city installed uplates or- Yeah, yeah that's all. Yeah, the yeah. 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 city installed ones. I mean, you yeah. shouldn't have to go do this door to door. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Okay, that sounds good. Okay, so, so that additional um, yeah, that'll be an additional recommendation, not just to replace the lights that I've discovered are out of compliance on Takits, but they should do their own assessment of all of them and see that they're in compliance or not. So we can include that as part of the motion. Right. And any more discussion? All in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Opposed? So the motion passes. Thank you, Rob. Okay. So the next report is the Ad Hoc Subcommittee on Strategic Planning and General Plan Update. Uh, so I've got nothing more to report on that. I think we'll maybe try to convene a meeting next, next month. Um, 
we'll see what happens with this additional input that the planning folks get on the general plan. Thank you. The next topic is water conservation. Uh, okay. Um, um, two updates from DWA's uh, board meeting this morning. Uh, first, I updated them on, on the city council approval um, the, on the 8th of the uh, concept design for the demo garden and the turf conversion at the airport and thank them for their support. And of course, quite happy about that. Um, the board approved proceeding with an MOU for a backup uh, powered <coughs> battery to me, <coughs> battery power generators at two of their facilities. Um, which would be funded under the CPC's um, S-CHIP program. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, I think last month, DWA has now adopted a new reporting system for water use reduction, uh, which is required by the State Water Resources Control Board. Uh, the new system is based on water production, including leaks instead of water consumption. Although DWA did report um, uh, the water reduction for September on both production and consumption, and it was roughly 8% for both of them. Uh, last month was very hot, so, and of course, I think it's the beginning of overseeding, so that may be why it's um, less of a reduction from the 2013 target um, than, than previous months. Uh, and DWA will reevaluate its water use reduction target, which is currently 10 to 13 percent um, from the 2013 baseline, once it receives water use objectives in accordance with long-term state conservation legislation <sighs> from DWA. Next is wellness. I think Carl has some progress to report. Yeah, so I'm meeting with a representative from uh, Parks, I mean, not Parks and Rec, from uh, Human Rights Commission uh, this Friday to discuss the coordination or the combining of our two proposals so we can get some more well, movement on this smoking resolution going forward. We meet this Friday. Thank you. Desert Community and Energy Community Advisory Committee. Okay, um, uh, recent meetings of both the DC Board and the CAC. So the board met um, yesterday afternoon and they approved a contract to develop a bill comparison tool for the website. And I know Commissioner Flanagan, that's something you had specifically mentioned, so it's now in the works. Uh, the board approved a uh, support letter to the CPUC asking for more transparency on the exit fee that CCA customers pay for power purchased by the IOUs before they became CCA customers. Uh, that will be on uh, the council consent agenda for this Thursday. Council will be asked to also to sign on the letter. Uh, the CAC, including Commissioners uh, Baker and Miller, we met last Thursday evening. Uh, we're looking into programs that could be offered to DC customers, including EV and battery storage incentives, energy efficiency programs, and solar rebates. I have a call um, scheduled for this Thursday morning um, with uh, Ben Dorian of, of, uh, of CBAG to uh, see how we can start moving those forward and assign to the various CAC members some additional research requirements. Uh, and then finally, DC staff and consultants are continuing their negotiations with solar and wind developers to secure long-term renewable energy. Uh, and I did some additional research for DC on a possible solar project. So those are the core items for uh, DC uh, right now. Okay. I think the screens froze for a moment. At least mine did. Okay. All right. So, so now the final item on the agenda is um, commissioner comments and upcoming agenda. So we'll go around the room, around the city, so to speak. Um, let's see. We'll go by the agenda. Commissioner or, or Rob, Vice Chair McCann. Uh, no comments. Okay. Carl? No comments. Jim? Um, I'm a little curious about the, my parking structure project, and I'm interested in anybody has any thoughts about um, weekend parking fees for the multi-story structure when that, when that parking structure is so overloaded as a way to uh, discourage driving and encourage uh, other forms of transportation. I'm not sure where to go with it, but if anyone has any interest, Maybe contact me separately or? 
So Jim, the problem is most of those people I would imagine are coming from exterior locations like Palm Desert and you know, so they are driving. Most of my friends now, we take Uber when we go out on the weekends. Well, we don't know that, but the problem is that that, that lot is jam-packed every single night. So yeah. if nothing else, it's a way to generate funding because even if you charge $3, it's mostly tourists that are using it. And I would think um, that maybe the, some of the locals could avoid using it, but I don't know, it's just, it, maybe this is outside of sustainability. And this is more a revenue generation thing that I'm thinking of, but I, I, I guess I'm the getting at that we're spending half a million dollars to subsidize driving and I, you know, it just, it irks me a little bit. So not sure where to go with it though. Is the bus bus running anymore? Oh. Uh, yeah, it's a good question. I don't know. That would be oh. a source of funding for the bus bus though. No, because uh, that that was dropped in the in the austerity budget. Yeah. That's so, an interesting point, though. If the buzz bus were to relieve parking, um, funding might be able to be freed up from the parking structure to fund for the buzz bus. So, um, something to think about. So, Jim, is this something you'd want to discuss more in a future meeting, or? I'm just wondering if anybody else besides me is interested in this, <laughs> or if not, I'll I'll kind of put hold I'll put a hold on it. And um, you're welcome to contact me later if you like or now. Can I so. suggest maybe that it would fit in because it is uh, it is a subject and, uh, and as Patrick mentioned um, was discussed in the uh, by council in the general plan update. So um, maybe as that would help to sort of provide some input as we we help uh, the planning commission and city council develop uh, the sort of uh, lower you know lower tier goals. Um, that would be good. So I, I'm not volunteering for it, but I can see a place for um, fitting it in in the general plan update given council's comment from their meeting two weeks ago um, that they're not necessarily going to be encouraging additional parking. Well, I can bring that up. I'm replacing Commissioner, um, uh, who left, um, on the general plan. John Goins. Yeah, uh, Commissioner Goins. So I can bring that up at our meeting in November. So would it be, uh, Commissioner, uh, Chair Clark, would it be uh, helpful if I were to spend, you know, 15 minutes doing a little update, maybe for the next go around about how much money comes in and how many people use it and if I can find any information about who uses it and things like that, just so we can just kind of get an overview over whether this is something we might have an interest in? I think that would be helpful, yes. And in the meantime, okay. Carl can talk to the, the steering committee and uh, see where that might fit in. So I think we okay. have. I was just, I was just thinking the other way around. If I'm going to dinner in El Paseo, I'm going to drive. I mean, that's the bottom line. I'm not going to take a bus. I mean, I might take a ride share, but there's no real other There's no alternative. And if you're going to do more than one thing, say you're going to go to McCallum and then have dinner or vice versa, you're 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 forced to use your car. Uh, well, I'm not sure what going to El Paseo has to do with, with this, but I, I mean... If someone's coming the, here from Palm Desert or La Quinta, they're, go they're going to drive, more than likely. Oh, I don't know about that. I think there's a large number of people that stay in downtown hotels that eat out. I think, and I think there's a lot of, you know, that, that lot is jam-packed all the time. And so a lot of people drive in it and drive out, and, you know, because there's no parking available in it, because I think if you were to... Um, to start charging fees in it, there'd be more availability of parking, which would reduce the number of people that are just driving around for hours looking for spots too. I mean, I think there's a lot of ways that this, you know, can address some sustainability issues. So um, I'd still like to look into it. So we'll, we'll include a, a place in the next meeting's agenda for more information from you. Yeah, um, just okay. one point on that, because it's not an agenda item, but Commissioner Flanagan, uh, I recall um, that the development agreement, uh, the development agreement with GRIT actually precludes um, charging for parking at the downtown lot across from the museum. So you might want to check on that, um, but uh, there may be a, there, there, there may be some, uh, a contractual prohibition. I do you remember oh, that oh. discussion as well, because that was a big thing having those 1200 free parking spots. All right, thanks, uh, David, I'll check into it. The same agreement was reached with the corporation during the Andes or whatever it's called now, that those underground parking spots would be free for the public. 
The, no, I'm not talking about the underground spots. I'm talking about the above ground garage, the five star garage on Just arenas. Out yeah. There are some covenants already in existence for parking spaces. Yeah. I'll check that to see if that's the case. That's it for me. Okay. David? Uh, nothing further, Chair Clark. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jen? Thank you. If we could put on the agenda for next time to have a discussion, if the commission wants to sponsor, co-sponsor some of these other contests for the coming year. Okay. Can I have that down? Um, Sandra? Um, two, two things that, um, as, as I think most of you know, I live and work downtown. I'm a pedestrian, I bike ride, and if I have to go uh, some, somewhere, I'll, I will take the bus. Um, during the summer, the buses, of course, become kind of housing during the heat uh, for homeless people. So most of the things I can do on foot or on my bicycle. Um, by the way, I do like the new intersections and the lights are really good. So I'm a big fan of all that work that was, uh, that was done. But this last month in particular, the, the drug use that is going on so blatantly on the street, now I'm, I'm accustomed to it, and usually you'll see it on the side or behind a building, parking lot, that sort of thing. But I'm talking about Palm Canyon as well, you know, central downtown and Indian Canyon right near the uh, casino and, you know, all of that area is being developed. This is bold in your face. You can't even access the bus, uh, the bus stops because they're housing and, you know, my impression is these are meth addicts. Uh, they're very active, they're very dirty, and they're actually, I mean, I, I didn't have my camera and it wasn't really appropriate anyway, of shooting drugs up right there on Indian Canyon at nine o'clock in the morning. Oh my God. And, and also, you know, Few, a few yards down, actually defecating right there on the sidewalk, you know, and it was like at least use a poop bag or something, you know, like you would do for a dog. I was shocked. And I'm an urban person, so I've seen it all, but I have not seen it. And it was, you know, just in my morning trip of going to the post office and down to grocery outlet and, and coming by, uh, back to my house. I couldn't, I couldn't avoid it. And that was, that was an early morning in downtown. And it was, it, it was blatant and more than I'd ever seen. And also just on my block where there's a lot of restaurants in the outside dining and that for the first time I'm seeing cocaine vials uh, that I've never seen. You, you know, you might see some, some debris packaging left over from, you know, one of the 420 shops, something like that. But now I'm seeing hard, hard drug paraphernalia just littering on the streets near very nice restaurants and residential and businesses. But the, um, the blatant drug use on the street though, uh, and, and, you know, and the hygiene issues was, was really shocking to me. And in a separate way, um, I, and I think it's great that they're taking advantage of the streets. And, you know, I know a lot of cities are doing that, even preparing for cold and rainy weather. Uh, which we're not going to have to do here and go to that expense. So I think that's great. And I think a certain amount of funkiness is very appropriate for Palm Springs. We don't want it to be too slick or, you know, Disney Vegas-like. But one of the things that um, concerned me, and I know with the spacing with the outside dining, was the use of materials. And, um, you know, right at the beginning of COVID in my own work, I had to do a lot of research on actual uh, material surfaces and how friendly it was uh, as a surface for the virus. Um, the least friendly uh, being copper and plastic being the most friendly where the virus can live on it for 72 hours. So what I'm seeing with most of the restaurants in downtown is a lot of use of plastic at a um, eye level, shoulder or eye level. So, and some of it is that kind of uh, artificial box hedge uh, that you'd use in a display, but this is also sitting outside 
in hot sun for hours day after day. I'm hoping that they would disinfect it, but then what does the disinfectant do to the quality of the plastic that was never meant to be cleaned on a regular basis like that? It's just display stuff, but it's plastic. But what I'm seeing is the, the use of so much plastic um, that is meant to be protecting people from virus. So it's a little bit too late, but I don't know if there is, as it goes on, or they're making maybe more uh, permanent type of um, building, you know, to accommodate the restaurant customers, which is great, but maybe some sort of help on using those materials. And I was, you know, I was thinking, even without going into the expense of pure copper, you could use a copper coated uh, wire mesh that would you know, still have airflow, it would be easy to clean, and it wouldn't be virus friendly. So I think there are some things that we could do just as far as providing information uh, to the restaurants and the, and the merchants about what materials are probably more successful in doing what they're trying to do of creating safe zones for people to sit and eat and, you know, and uh, have, a, have a nice time out. So I think that was something uh, that just got overlooked in the in the rush to increase business again. But it concerns me because one way or another, you've got plastics breaking down in sun, and hopefully they're disinfecting them. But plastic is is the worst thing that they could be using as a as a barrier. So uh, that was just um, you know my street beat reporter. Uh, from downtown. So for what it's worth, it might be something that we might be able to help them with and not, it's not just putting up uh, partitions. And, you know, the difference, I'm not looking for uniformity. Like I said, I, I think all of that is, is very in keeping with the spirit of Palm Springs. But the use of the materials, particularly the plastic, uh, I think is questionable and also not, maybe not healthy. So you, you have a specific proposal for a future discussion by the commission or action? I think so, uh, to help guide those merchants that are doing the outside uh, dining. And now if you have, you know, classes, churches, things like that, where they're doing worship outside, you know, while we're in, uh, you know, in more restricted areas, um, it would be helpful for people to know what is um, more effective. And, you know, the, the copper coated uh, is not expensive. And there's also from, you know, I mean, we've, we've gotten them from landfill in the past, the copper plates, they're copper plated that they use for printing. Once they're used, they throw them away, you know, and they develop beautiful vertigree and stuff like that. But they're, they're thin, they're like very lightweight thin, so you can use them decoratively, um, but they're covered with uh, pure copper. So that might be something as far as the building material, and I don't know what the architecture uh, people have done with this, um, but the, the use of the plastics, especially at that, you know, at that um, head and shoulder level, I think is, is maybe something that we should think about. Okay. Maybe at least give a list of, of um, preferred materials. So would you like to make a more specific presentation at the meeting next month with recommendations? Yeah. Okay. Okay. We can have that as new business. Thank you. Great. No comments. Thank you. Lonnie, are you there? Hi, uh, no comments. Okay. I'd just like to make uh, one comment. Um, I think you all know that uh, we currently have two vacancies on the commission, uh, John Gowen's position and T. Santora's position. Um, the city council has decided that um, along with our commission and several other commissions that currently have vacancies, they're going to wait to fill the vacancies until December when they also will be addressing um, terms that have expired and reappointing people or um, appointing new people to those positions. So there won't be any additional selections uh, or appointments um, to, to the commissions until, until December. And um, Patrick and I did work on a short recruiting document for the commission, which talks about what we do and also um, what our immediate focuses are for the next year. And that has been posted on 
Facebook, and Nextdoor. So are there any other comments before we adjourn? See, our next meeting will be November 17th at 5.30. Is there a motion to adjourn this meeting? Motion to adjourn. Thank you, Rob. Second. Second. Who was that? Who was that? It was Carl. Oh, Carl. Okay, thank you. All in favor, say aye. 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 The meeting is then adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you.